this could well be a case of um, a jack of all trades, master of none. So um, apologies if uh, um, that's, that's, that's the case. So the first thing to say is the obligatory about us um, slide. Um, so this is the ACU. Um, we are an international uh, university network. Um, our proud claim is to be the first in the world. We used to say oldest, but we weren't sure oldest was always best, so we've changed that to the first in the world. Um, and our centenary is next year, so we start that in, um, um, that gets launched um, next week, in fact. Um, and uh, about 114 of our members are in Africa, um, uh, with a large number um, in Asia. Um, so our southern membership and our focus has been um, tilted south uh, for the last few decades. Okay, so a disclaimer as well. Um, the views are my own. The ideas are undoubtedly not my own. Um, so I've um, picked up an awful lot from working with various um, colleagues and organisations, um, many in this room. Um, most of all, I think, from lots of interaction over the last few years with a lot of colleagues in African universities, where much of this learning comes from. Um, so I hope I do it some justice. Um, I'm going to talk about um, capacity. Um, and that's a picture I could, It's a hard concept to illustrate, but I thought these guys looked like they had capacity to take on whatever's about to come next. Um, it's probably quite a nasty uh, um, set of rapids. Um, this is some of the work we've been doing at the ACU in the last few years where some of this um, thinking has emerged from and where it's been published. Um, there's also been a lot from other organisations um, who've been tackling some of, the, of these questions, like the um, uh, Partnership for Higher Education Africa, um, some important work done here in Cape Town um, at CHET. Um, so this is by no means a, um, an attempt just to provide a, a kind of ACU perspective. Um, in the UK we have something called the uh, UK Collaborative um, on Development Sciences and we have a research capacity strengthening working group. Um, we all try and come together and try and share some lessons and try and get, up, get a better handle on kind of how we support that amongst the various um, research bodies, entities, research councils and funders in the UK. Um, and here's some definitions that I pulled out about what uh, research capacity, capacity might mean. The top one there uh, uh, comes from CEDA, the bottom one comes from, um, from, from DFID. But what I thought was important to uh, draw out here were um, some of the, the kind of depth of this. Um, I think there's lots of conversations which, which uh, tend to think of capacity as something being built and then it's done and there you go. But there's um, you don't um, as often hear about all the kind of struggles, the power, um, the politics, um, the complexity of it all, uh, dealing with attitudes and behaviours, resistance to change. Um, so it's a very complex um, area. And I think people are still trying to get a handle on actually how you can support research capacity. And capacity which um, is capacity for uh, it to be reproduced um, in the future as well. Um, I think what's um, really important to, to highlight in this slide here is it's um, uh, in the bottom corner here, but it's beyond the technical um, and value-neutral transfer of skills, and that's um, a quote I picked up from um, one paper which um, explores this in a bit more depth. Um, so we often talk about research capacity um, existing and requiring support at three levels. Um, the individual level, so um, researchers and academic staff through um, training, scholarships, uh, professional development, um, to do research, to publish their research, then to engage with, um, with, with um, external audiences and to communicate their work, um, in some cases trying to have some influence with their work. Uh, then we have the organisational level, that's the research institute or the university, um, and all the systems in place um, uh, and facilities that mean an individual researcher can do their work in an environment conducive to working, uh, 
with the right support um, and the right kind of scholarly um, environment. Many universities and research institutes are arranged in sort of larger research consortia, um, particularly those funded through some of the larger, um, larger funding programmes. Um, and then at the top we have this kind of enabling environment, which is the national, <coughs> regional and international policy context um, in which individuals and their institutions fit. Um, and that's something which I think is, um, which is nothing I can talk with uh, much authority about here, but is a um, particularly <coughs> difficult nut to crack. How do you convince governments um, to actually make the investments in research, set the right policies, um, and create a um, kind of national system which then values research um, and invest in it properly. Um, that was another sort of um, attempt to look at what research capacity might mean um, at the organisational level. This um, comes from um, an organisation based not too far away, the uh, Community Development Resource, Resource Association. Um, and that's their framework for um, developing organisational capacity. And again, I think it's interesting the way it explicitly highlights issues of culture, um, in terms of organisational culture, strategy, structure, um, and material resources is just one part of this um, uh, framework they've developed. Um, so, the kind of background at the moment, the, the, uh, the um, research capacity environment in Africa, um, there's been an awful lot of talk about the uh, major undersea cables coming on shore in the past few years and how that's dramatically transforming um, broadband opportunities. But what does that mean um, for the actual um, desktop user? How much access do they have and how much is this sort of broadband change um, is this being felt at a um, much more local level? Um, well, Alan Jackson um, of Aptimate, uh, Activate estimated that that's about 40 kilobits a second. So that's um, uh, a lot slower than you might be led to believe by um, some of these impressive um, and um, exciting infrastructure projects. There's, there's actually still a lot of work to be done um, until an individual user at their desk in a university or research institute um, start to benefit from this. I'm just going to try and keep pace here on my notes. A bit out of sync. We did some work um, last December. We had um, a few colleagues uh, in three universities just to test the download of an article from a UK-based publisher and to time how long, how long it would take. Now, the University of Nairobi um, has benefited, uh, benefited uh, particularly from um, lots of these new cables coming in. Um, so it, had, it had a fairly fast um, response rate, 55 seconds to download a modest-sized journal article, not one with large charts or large data sets. Um, it took two to four minutes um, at two campuses in Malawi. Um, but in Uganda, a user at a university outside the capital um, failed on three attempts. It just timed out. Um, and this was not a, um, a big, heavy journal article. It was a fairly modest um, paper. Now, I'm going to borrow here quite a lot from, um, from some work done by, um, done by Chet um, in Cape Town. Um, and they've done some really interesting work recently trying to um, develop some measures of capacity and try and set this in a framework to explore what needs to be done, what, um, what it is about the university environment um, and the way it interacts with um, kind of national policy um, that actually means <coughs> university research can, um, and work can impact um, on development. And they have, of their three notions, they have one which is the, um, the academic core. Um, and they have a couple of, um, of ways of measuring this. Um, and one is the, um, 
proportion of staff um, holding PhD qualifications. Um, so this is a combination of data from, um, from two studies, um, one by Wisdom Tetty, um, the US Foundation's partnership, um, and one by Chet. And it shows um, that there's a, a fairly mixed picture. Um, some countries um, have better levels of academic staff uh, qualifications than others. Um, some universities have very different um, uh, doctoral levels. Um, and there's a big difference um, here in the example of Kenya between public and private universities. Um, so this, um, as Susan said, you can't really, really generalize. And I think this, this kind of helps to show um, what we're talking about research capacity, it's, a, it's an extremely mixed um, and very varied landscape um, across the continent. Another um, way of looking at it is the, um, uh, this is more kind of output measure, the um, number of PhDs being produced um, over a number of years. And you can see here, um, these are relative numbers, but there's actually been a fall um, in Nairobi, some, some um, sizable increases in Botswana. When you look at the actual numbers of PhD produced um, in 2007, um, there's a, again a fairly mixed picture, but this is across all disciplines um, in each of, the, each of those universities. So this tells you something about the, the, um, the essential capacity that, that the university has in order to do research um, and to publish research and to train future uh, generations of academics. So moving on to some thoughts about, um, about open access um, and how that um, intersects with, with research capacity. Um, a lot of um, the, dis the discussion talks about um, the basic availability of academic journals. Um, particularly online, and, and obviously open access has a, has a massive potential to really increase that. But, um, but it's worth bearing in mind that there's been a lot of work done over the last decade or so to in, uh, increase the availability of academic journals anyway. Um, there's been work um, from Research for Life, um, from Eiffel, and some INAS, and actually um, a huge number of peer-reviewed scholarly journals are available um, free at the point of use to um, huge numbers of um, researchers across the continent. Um, and we did some work a couple of years ago now um, and um, trying to quantify this and, and trying to work out how much of the um, top tier journal literature was available through um, a few of these access initiatives. Um, now, I'm about to get myself into some serious trouble because I used um, a, uh, an ISI um, ranking metric here. Um, so that was uh, two years ago. It was a very, uh, very na uh, naive and innocent entrant to this world. Um, so this needs to be redone, I think, for a, for a more sensitive um, measure. Um, but it, um, it seemed to show that across... 11 universities, and that's in 11 countries which all have national licensing, that 73% um, of the top tier journals um, in a range of subjects were actually available, um, if you like, on the virtual shelf of that university's library for any researcher to access in that university um, without paying any additional fee. Um, an awful lot of these on... Um, on IP authenticated access, so then these are passwords. Um, so while I admit it's not um, a perfect measure of what a top journal might be, even if we should be talking of top journals, it, it was designed to show that an awful lot has been achieved in making literature available anyway. Um, that just shows the picture um, across those 11 universities. Um, you know, Variation, but um, all fairly close to the average um, of 73%. And when, uh, when we asked um, 
some academics and some postgraduate students, well, what, um, what are the journals which you need? Um, which ones can't you access? Which ones do you want to use, but at the moment you don't have access to them and you can't do your work? Um, we had a, um, had a long list of 270 journals. When we looked at them, uh, we found that um, most of those were actually available um, in their current collections. So a massive issue here of, um, of awareness. And the reason I think this is, this is important because I think this, this um, matters as much for, um, for open access journals as it does for um, traditional scholarly publishing. And um, it was notable that a couple of years ago, um, a seminar in Nairobi, uh, um, a deputy vice chancellor from a major university in Kenya stood up and said to the assembled audience of academics, you know, the big problem is we can't do our work, we don't have access to the journals. Um, and his librarian who happened to be, be in the room stood up and said, well, um, respectfully, I beg to differ, but we've got um, 34,000 titles available. You should, you should come to the library sometime. So, but just that massive issue of um, assisting academics and researchers to understand what's there for them to use and helping them get there. Um, there's a, there's a big question, I think, which is um, um, there's still room for um, lots of discussion here, whether this is um, the move to open access um, enables a convergence in research globally between North and South, or whether there's a, um, a danger here of being another divergent track. Um, so Northern researchers um, have a potential to do research and, and to publish and to re-research which their colleagues in Africa and elsewhere may not have under a new system. I think there's, there's um, plenty to, um, to be discussed there. I'm not, I'm not entirely sure which way um, I've been trying to go at the moment. Um, in conclusion, um, every time I ask different colleagues here or in the UK who work a lot with African colleagues, um, there's some um, very varied perspective, I think particularly when you ask people in the social sciences, um, which, which is often not a um, set of disciplines who perhaps feel as, um, as closely involved in these, um, in these, in these debates uh, as certainly need to be. Um, just to return to that, I think the, the issue is, is um, uh, it's particularly on on the publishing side, are we in danger of reaching um, a situation where um, an African researcher um, can read everything, but in certain subjects, certain disciplines, is only able to publish um, in a paper which, which won't require <coughs> an APC? I know lots of the journals that have been discussed already today um, have put in place very important and impressive, sy um, impressive systems um, of um, the fee waivers, but um, whether that can be translated across the disciplines um, is yet to be seen, I think. Um, so thinking about what the possibilities for universities are, they're, they're obviously huge for open access. Um, uh, in this kind of mixed economy, they'll be able to um, potentially have fewer subscription payments but actually get more content. Um, if it's all open, there's no need to wrestle with um, uh, with passwords, with IP ranges, um, all the complexities of actually making sure what's available can be accessed on campus, off campus, etc. Um, it means African research would be, be more visible, so universities work would be more, um, be more internationally, internationally available, both through um, um, being published in open access journals, but also in repositories. Um, I think that's important for building the case for what a university can do um, to contribute nationally to its own development uh, needs and priorities, um, and in doing so build a case for investment in the university. Um, there's not an awful lot um, around um, new ways in which they can measure their research um, and track where it's going, um, how it's influencing, how it's being read, um, and where the uptake is. Um, <coughs> And with the open educational movement, um, 
and the Creative Commons licensing, actually improving their, um, their teaching materials. Um, but there's, there are quite a few challenges here as, here as well. So um, many university leaders still don't really appreciate um, not, not just what the advantages of open access might be, <coughs> but what it actually means, what, what is this open concept. Um, and an awful lot um, of experienced senior academics um, seem very wary of, um, of online publishing. And there's a, um, I think in lots of, um, lots of universities, there's a, um, a belief or, or perhaps a myth which, um, which gets circulated um, but has um, fairly strong currency that anything which is free must be inferior. Um, and the quality stuff must still be a, a subscription journal um, and they're trying to fob us off with some free material um, not wanting us to have the kind of real quality stuff. Um, and I um, spoke to um, a group of um, junior researchers um, in Accra earlier in the year and I was struck that, um, that actually Lots of them felt the the university policy um, wouldn't um, wouldn't recognise um, an open access journal um, as relevant to a promotional um, application. And it wasn't just an open, open access journal; it was um, anything which existed only in an online electronic form, unless their senior researcher, their kind of head of department, could actually hold a physical copy. They weren't prepared to accept it um, in promotions. That's that's purely anecdotal, but it's a um, it's a worrying situation. Something which really shows how much needs to be done to um, to re realise the potential um, of online and open publishing. Um, and obviously, open access is a national broadband network, but in institutional. Um, networks um, and in the IT facilities so that um, students and researchers have enough, um, enough computers um, and sufficient bandwidth to actually get hold of all this material. And there are also challenges and possibilities for the reader. So um, um, possibilities, they've got much more available um, when they're doing their work they can draw on um, what's being done elsewhere without um, the danger of doing a piece of work which neglects to take into account some of the latest <coughs> findings. They'll be less cut off from their in international peers. Um, that opens up potential for more, um, more cross-regional work. Um, and they can update their um, the teaching materials too. But again, some of the other challenges that um, I think many um, colleagues have pointed to, particularly in a mixed world, is this um, incredible confusion which, which reigns at present. Um, and whether research is open or not, there's, a, there's still a massive need to um, um, support researchers um, and students particularly in, in sort of navigating through this wealth of online material, um, discovering it, searching it, understanding how to interrogate what is good, what is bad, what's, what's, um, what's, what's appropriate, um, and helping them to um, be confident that an open access journal, a free journal, an online journal is, a, is also a, um, a, a publication of quality and rigor, um, and that they can understand how that peer review process works so they can get a, um, a better grip on that. Um, for authors, um, again, there are huge opportunities here, um, many more opportunities to be published, greater visibility, both in journals and in repositories, um, and becoming known um, outside their own local institutions and countries and networks um, <coughs> at an international scale. Um, there's a, um, a huge opportunity there. Um, 
but again, some of the same challenges. What is a reputable journal? How to build confidence um, in this system? How to judge quality? Um, and there's, um, I think, a lot of fear um, about about putting work on the internet, particularly data, that it's not a safe place to publish. Somebody's going to take your work and is going to going to reuse it. And while I think many of those of those concerns can be answered quite well, um, those kind of fears and myths do do um, do circulate widely. Um, and many, I think, fear um, even with fee waivers, they won't be able to afford to publish. That they'll only be able to afford to publish so much of their work, um, and there'll be some kind of rationing system in place. So again, a massive need to raise awareness um, and educate and explain how this system works. Um, and again, the um, <coughs> promotional issue, um, which I um, touched on earlier. So I think. Um, as Laura pointed to, um, there's a kind of huge, a huge iceberg here, um, and below that is all the messy, complicated university systems and committees and um, things to negotiate, people to win round, to bring on board, champions to find, um, skeptics to win over, which really need to be address this kind of open shift to really have um, a transformative impact on research capacity. Um, I think a massive issue which is often missed in, um, in conversations which, are, which focus on, on availability and on access is on the way research is used um, and, and how much research gets, gets read um, either by students as part of their, their um, undergraduate or postgraduate teaching and learning um, or by academics themselves, and I, um, with um, the blessing of INASP, I took some of their um, peri download data, tried to work out what that might mean for a particular country. So, um, in 2007, and I took that year because it because it um, had the best, it, it was the best match to some data I could find on um, number of uh, tertiary students and staff. That 71,000 downloads. Um, in that year from 50,000 students and 2,000 academics. So that's a, that's a potential reach. You know, I've no idea how many of those academics um, and students might, um, might expect to have claim on that material. But it's, you know, it's just over one download per year per potentially active researcher, student, or, or academic. And um, I think that really shows um, the massive, massive need to um, get to grips with actually how literature um, is involved um, and incorporated into the teaching process, if academics are updating reading lists, if they're encouraging students to go and um, access journals, if they're uh, requiring citations of journal articles in their submitted work, in their essays, in their coursework, um, and what the, what the incentives are to do research in the first place. Um, now it's a, you know, it's a, um, it's commonly said students go to Google, um, you know, they don't, they don't have the, um, the search skills which means they can discover peer-reviewed literature. Um, we can't get away from Google and there's probably no need to. That's, that's a, a perfectly fine approach, but I think students really need support in and understanding how to um, how to filter what they get back, how to how to assess where something's come from, its provenance, its suitability. Is it is this a scholarly piece of work or is it a PDF posted on a, a blog somewhere? Is it a, um, is it an opinion or is it an academic um, and uh, peer-reviewed? Um, Piece of literature. Um, going back to the kind of IT inf infrastructure point, um, if 20 students are sharing access to a computer in Nairobi and 30 in Malawi, how much time are they actually going to spend reading a journal article, even after they've spent um, 
all that time searching for it, um, trying to find the ones which, which are useful to their essay. Um, I, I, um, I, I observed some um, groups of students a couple of years ago, and they quite often would just take, it, take their um, essay question and dump it straight into a Google search. Um, really, really struggled to understand how to break it down into search terms, which would um, give them some options. But if they've only got um, really limited time to spend on the computer, there's no real time to build that um, understanding um, and become more familiar. Um, and it's highly surprising when you see students um, on Facebook or, or on YouTube, because the time they have may not be that meaningful to do um, academic work um, in a shared computer lab of, um, um, with an awful long queue at, at the back door. Um, these are some, some um, quotes here I took from some responses um, of junior academics um, on their experiences of trying to establish themselves in their departments um, as researchers. Um, and they spoke um, in fairly um, concerning terms about not really being welcomed, not being encouraged, um, being blocked at various turns, being held back, um, feeling it says here intellectually lost. Um, they were in a place where research wasn't really being valued as a pursuit. And this is again, it's a this is an awful generalisation, but it but these kind of comments did come from a range of um, of young researchers from, um, from different institutions. Um, and I think it's a kind of anecdotal um, response which is, um, which is often heard. Um, and these junior researchers, to establish themselves, they need to be connected in internationally, but also regionally and um, in their own countries. They need to get published, they need to define a research agenda, they need seed funding, they need to learn how to be the people who support the next generation so they can, they can bring up um, postgraduate students of their own. Um, and all this means they have to be in departments and institutions which are supportive of them, mentoring them and encouraging them. And I think when we think of open access, um, open research, open education, it's these issues about um, departmental and institutional research cultures we've really got to think about so we make sure that the, um, the increasing access to the content and the material actually builds capacity um, and builds um, supportive um, and conducive research environments. There's an awful lot talked about consultancy problem. Um, there's an enormous um, um, level of consultancy activity which rarely makes its way into publication, occupies many academics' time. Um, and this quote from a um, Ugandan study um, that most of the academics in a department weren't, weren't actually available to teach and to do research. They were all being hired out as consultants. Um, it's a problem which... Um, which Johan Mouton talks about um, as the deinstitutionalization of research in the university, that it becomes a collective of individual people pursuing their own interests without a sense of a kind of cohesive department agenda um, with a, uh, a research mission, um, training postgraduates, um, bringing up the next generation, mentoring and supervising, um, engaging in discussion in departmental seminars, all these things which are the kind of basic um, activities um, of academic life. And he says that um, from a survey that they did at, um, did at Crest in, um, in Stellenbosch of 800 academics from 12 South African, Southern African countries, 62% were involved in consultancy work. Um, so again, that, that kind of really shows that there's a massive, um, uh, I suppose, lack of um, 
throughput to research, um, which will make it into publication, which will make it into research which gets published and read and then recycled back into research. Um, and there's a quote here from Mandani, which he gave at um, his lecture in Uganda um, last year about the real dangers of a, a consultancy focused um, research um, environment that, that in, in the process research and scholarship aren't really being developed, you're kind of answering somebody else's questions, you're not learning how to, um, how to, uh, how to analyse the issues, um, you're just thinking of it as a kind of problem solving exercise. So I think to, to kind of conclude, it's, um, it's useful to, um, to go back to um, a quote from um, the um, Czech report, which I put up earlier. Um, and that's that um, this is a much more complex picture than, than just turning on, on tap and um, increasing the supply of materials and resources. And there's so many uh, contradictory um, <coughs> incentives, um, politics, policies at work here. Um, and as Laura's presentation showed, this needs to be done at a really, really um, an institutional level. It's, it's, it's not something where there's a, a kind of a one-size-fits-all solution um, that we can um, identify what works and then just roll it out across the board. And that's, that's, that's me done.